In the New Testament community today, we hear a great deal from television and radio evangelists about the word of faith. And we see people healed on a continuous basis. And all these things are good, and I believe them. I believe people are being healed. I believe people are having demons cast out. And I believe that faith is the way to be saved. I will not deny not one of these good works that are being done in the name of Jesus. However, I do want to read a scripture. And I think it identifies the visible church that is seen on radio and television today. And most of the mainline large churches that you see today in the United States, Great Britain, Western Europe, mainly physical Israelites today. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, the Apostle Paul, of course, in his day, knew more of God's law than any other of the Sanhedrin for his age. And that's why he was specifically handpicked by God to write a great deal of the New Testament so that we could understand God's law in relationship to faith. In verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I believe this describes perfectly the visible church that we see today. There's a great deal of zeal, a love for the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. People who have a great desire to serve God. They want to do all the good works such as miracles, speak in tongues, the word of knowledge, receive supernatural manifestations from God, and yet their faith is not based upon accurate knowledge. There is a great zeal that is just permeating the religious field today, but it is not based upon knowledge. Now in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus becomes straightforward. He doesn't mince words, and I'm not either, because I think that I have to speak what Jesus said, and I cannot compromise, even though my heart can feel very sad for many in the New Testament community today. But they're being deceived, and they're being misled even though they are zealous and they have a great deal of zeal for God. Now in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out demons. The word is devil, but it's actually demons. There's only one devil. And in your name done many wonderful works. Then will I, this is Jesus, the only Christ of Almighty God, the only one that we can be saved through. He says, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Even though you were casting out demons in my name, you were prophesying in my name, you had a word of knowledge, you had great faith, demons were subject to you. Jesus said, depart from me, you that work iniquity. The Greek word iniquity literally means violator of law. Violator of law. Now, I have a question today. Is faith enough? Is faith enough for the New Testament church today? We're told over and over, faith. Without faith, there is no salvation. Without faith, you can't come to God. You can't be pleasing to God. But is faith enough? And does the New Testament, the visible church today, understand that there is more than just faith? Or do they base everything they do upon the word faith? In James chapter 2, James begins to identify the truth about faith. And, it need, and this needs to be brought out so that all of us can understand our relationship to God, whether we have a zeal for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but not based upon knowledge, and whether, where we can harness that zeal and put it into a correct format so that then we can become acceptable to God in an ever-increasing way. Now in James chapter 2 verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? Paul just comes straight out and he's, or James, comes straight out and says, can faith save a man? When people come on the television screen, they come over the radio and they talk about faith and that's all they talk about. Can that faith save? Oh, no, it can't. Just faith cannot save. 
Now, let's look in verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warned, be filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? What good will it do for a brother to come to you, whether it be a husband or a wife in need of affection from the other person, or whether it's a person who is financially, financially strapped, they have no money, they can't buy food, and that brother or sister comes and then you say, oh, I understand, and you have something to help that person with, and you just tell them to go away, and you don't provide anything. Has that faith that that brother has shown, and that faith that you have in God done one thing, it hasn't accomplished anything. Faith, standing by itself, can do nothing. Look at verse 17. Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Or, if you want to correct the Greek word alone, it means by itself. So having faith in God, simply by itself, separate and apart from works, is fruitless. It doesn't bear any fruit whatsoever. Now, look in verse 18. Yes, a man may say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and look what James says. I will show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. It cannot accomplish anything. Visibly, outwardly, you may see something, but separate and apart from works. And we're going to see what some of those works are in just a moment. Verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. But if you believe and you have faith and that's all you have and you're living on a word of faith, even the demons believe and tremble. And yet, is one demon going to be saved? Not one, because they will not repent. Verse 20. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? This is the New Testament. James wanted us to make sure we knew that we cannot just have what's called faith and have faith even to cast out demons in the name of Jesus and then that's all there is to it. We can turn around, walk away, fold up our tent, go home, we have love for Jesus, we have faith in Jesus, and that's all. It just doesn't cut the mustard. Verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Look at that, verse 20. Verse 21, the word justified. Look it up. It literally means to render just or to render an individual innocent. Do we comprehend what this is saying? Faith by itself cannot render you or me innocent of the sins we've committed in the past. It says right here, was not our father justified by works. Abraham, when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, that's when he was rendered innocent. Once he literally performed the work and God said, now I know that you will obey me. That's when he was rendered innocent and just before God. In other words, you don't just come to God and say, I want to receive Jesus in my heart. And you walk away and that's it for your Christian life. That is no such thing that is not conversion to Jesus Christ. It is something that is a deception in the New Testament church today that is causing untold millions to go down a primrose path toward destruction and not toward obedience. You cannot be rendered innocent of any guilt from the past unless you repent of what you've done. You cannot do it. Justification comes by works combined with faith. Now look at verse 22. See you how faith with his works. So Abraham's faith combined with his works and by works was faith made perfect. It's a combination. One plus one equal two. Faith plus works equal perfection. Being rendered innocent in God's sight, therefore no sin can be found in you. But it does take the combination. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And what does the word believe show? We've already seen in the context that once he believed, he also performed. Faith, belief, 
plus works or performance, the combination rendered him innocent. Now, verse 24, or the latter part of verse 23. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, the word believed here in this verse is number 4100 in the Strong's Concordance of the Greek language. And it literally means to have faith in, upon, a person or a thing. So here Abraham had faith in Jesus Christ, in God the Father. Well, at that time, it was the great Yahweh, the Eternal, that was dealing directly with Abraham and not the Father. But he had faith in everything that he said. Therefore, he was willing to perform whatever Jesus told him. And it also means to entrust. He entrusted his entire life, the entire future from which he was looking for a city without foundations, whose builder and maker was God, and he entrusted his entire future to the very words that Jesus gave him. And this word believe comes from number 4102, the root word, which means persuasion. So he was literally persuaded that whatever Jesus told him, Jesus would perform. Therefore, as a result, Abraham performed. Because God said, do this. Abraham did it. And therefore, he was rendered innocent. But his sins were not forgiven until the faith combined with the works rendered him innocent. Now, I'm getting to something, so don't go away yet. Don't turn it off and go to sleep. I'm getting to something on down the line. But I want to lay the groundwork first. Now, let's go to verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified. And we just saw what the word justified meant to render innocent of all past guilt. So it is by works that a man is justified and not by faith only. So it's the faith in the, in the saving blood of Jesus Christ, Christ our Passover first. That's first. Once that faith comes then there must be works or a performance on our part for the rest of our lives. And once that combination has occurred, then you're rendered innocent. So from that day forward, you can now be pleasing to God. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit or without the breath, if you have a more expensive Bible, it'll be corrected from spirit to breath. Just like we breathe and that's what keeps us alive. So this body without the breath is dead. It's called a corpse. So faith, which is like the breath, without works, is dead. So one is the body, the other is the breath that keeps it alive. It takes a combination of the two. So faith without works is dead. Brethren, one of the very foundational principles of Christ is faith. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it talks about the foundation that Jesus laid the New Testament church upon. He gave all his laws in the Old Testament. But then he gave some principles and some doctrines in the New Testament. In chapter 6 of Hebrews, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. You can't go to perfection until you have faith combined with works. But one of these is the last four words of faith toward God. That's one of the major principles of Christ. So faith is an absolute necessity if you and I are going to receive salvation. But faith standing by itself will not save us. We cannot be rendered innocent from our past sins by faith only. Now look in Hebrews chapter 11. This is the faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It is an absolute necessity for every person that confesses the name of Jesus to have faith. We must believe. We must entrust our lives, our future, and eternity into the hands of Jesus to believe that whatever he says, he can bring it to pass. So if he makes a promise to us in the scriptures, we must believe or entrust that he has the power to carry it out no matter what the visible obstacles are around us. So you see, we're not living by sight, but we're living literally by those things that are unseen. Romans chapter 1. I'm still laying the groundwork. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, or 17. Romans 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. 
As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You and I, if we are to be justified from our past sins, rendered innocent, we must live by faith. So faith is an ongoing thing. It never stops. Never. When our sins are totally forgiven, and upon repentance and baptism, then we're absolutely justified. We're rendered innocent of all past guilt. No sin can be found in us anymore unless we go out and accidentally sin. Then we have an advocate with the Father. But we're to live by faith. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 and verse 7. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame purpose is God. So God's called us. He's working a purpose in our lives. Who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. God has given to us a down payment on a spirit body. That's what it is, an earnest. When you buy a home and you put earnest money down, it's a down payment showing a pledge to, to, so that you'll give the rest of the money to purchase that home. So it is that God has given us an earnest of the Spirit. It comes into our mind and it resides there. And so God is giving us a down payment or a pledge that we're going to have a spirit body just like he does. The same composition. Verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So you see, we must come to the point in our life where we, no matter what the physical circumstances around us are, just like ancient Israel was in Egyptian bondage, they had no say-so in their lives. They couldn't rise up and go anywhere they wanted by themselves. They had no freedom to travel that country. They had no freedom to go out into the wilderness a three days journey and sacrifice to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They had no freedom. They were slaves. Just like you and I are slaves to the physical, to our sins, until we are literally rendered innocent by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, faith in that shed blood, and then works which are to follow. And it becomes a lifetime of overcoming and of working. But that does not mean that you're going to work out your salvation. You can't just perform works because, you see, in the past, we were as good as dead because we had broken God's law. And Jesus said himself that even you and I, when we, when we do everything that is required of us, we are still an unprofitable servant. You see, we, are, we should be dead for all eternity for just one sin. And so when we actually accept through faith and start using works to render us innocent, that does not mean that those works save us. It, that's only our duty from now on because God has done the saving in the past when we accepted that shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. But works is very... It, it's... It's something that seems complicated. Now, in my mind, it's not. But many, I get a lot of letters from people every time I come out with a sermon on radio uh, talking about obedience or talking about deception through grace and we say we're saved and therefore we don't have to do anything anymore. There's no obedience to anything. There's no doctrine. So I'm flooded with, usually it's members of the Baptist church and then they talk about how you cannot be saved by works, which I agree with. I agree with. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection, or set your mind, is the actual Greek, on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, if we set our minds on things that are above, in the heavens, spiritual things, then we can have that faith and that confidence in Christ. But if we're only looking to the physical surroundings around us, then we can never have peace of mind on this earth because there is a supernatural spirit world that hates God. They hate Jesus Christ. And they're going to do everything they can to disturb you mentally, disturb you physically, so that you will become depressed and give up on salvation. So that you'll think that God is not powerful and he cannot release you from the bondage which we're held in this flesh body of sin. And yet he can. And he will at the right time. That's why it says, He that endures unto the end will be saved. 
It's not he that just receives Jesus in his heart now and lives any way he wants. There is an enduring process. And if there was an endurance, then why would, he, why would we have the whole Bible telling over and over and over the works of the flesh, how we're to put them off, which are works. It takes work to overcome the carnal nature that we have. It is not an easy job. Verse, verse 3, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. And we're going to find out before we're through how we are dead. Because if you don't die, then you have no salvation. If you don't die, you're not hid with Christ. Now we'll get to that and what this death is in just a minute. Verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. Because then you will have a glorified body because of the earnest of the Spirit, which he's given to us ahead of time. That down payment that resides, it's sort of like God's genetic makeup. And he's putting it into our mind so that we can begin to change from a fleshly existence to a spiritual existence. It elevates us to a higher plane of living. And therefore it renders our mind spiritual. Even though the fleshly body still pulls and tugs and causes us to sin when we temporarily live by the flesh instead of the spirit. See, Now Hebrews chapter 1 says very conclusively that we must, that what faith is, to a degree. It's not a complete definition, but it is a partial definition. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance, or it's the ground, or it's the ev confidence, or evidence. Well, I would say confidence. It is the confidence of things hoped for. So we have confidence that God the Father is offering us a city made without hands. That's what Abraham was looking for. An eternal city with an eternal body so there'll never be any more death. The evidence of things not seen. So this, in a nutshell, is basically what faith is. We have to have confidence, not in the surroundings, but in those things that we are hoping for in the future and that we cannot see here, but we have physical evidence, the Bible the death of Jesus, a historical character, a resurrection, one of the most talked about things in the world. How could this go on and on if, there, if it was not an actual happening in history? So there is evidence that this Bible is accurate. And it's, it gives us confidence that we can hope for the unseen that is not yet here. Just like you can go through all the prophecies in the Bible, those that are fulfilled in the past, and you can literally see that they are historical events and that you cannot understand modern history unless you go back and you can see how God foretold what was going to happen in the past. And then when you see absolute fulfillment of prophecy, it gives you faith or confidence in the things that God says will occur but has not yet occurred. So this is where we're leading into. Faith, when we have this faith, we can combine it with works. Now I want to give just a couple of examples of works to show how faith combined with works is what God expects of us. Now in Hebrews chapter 11 here, verse 7. Verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now what if Noah... When God warned him of a flood that was going to come, what if he had had faith and said, I believe you can save me, God. And then he sat down under a tree and started whittling and said, I'm waiting for you to save me. What if Noah had never gone out, as I'll just use modern terminology, and put an ad in the newspaper and said, I need 612 laborers and I need 42 supervisors and we're going to build a boat. It's going to be the largest a vessel that has ever been conceived by man. It's going to be an, a, a work of art. I'll pay you for it, and I want you to apply next Tuesday. And then suddenly he goes through a whole line of people, and he finds out all these people that are qualified for this job. Great carpenters, people who can drive nails, people who use pitch and tar to seal things, to make it waterproof. And what if Noah had not done such a thing and he hadn't gone down and cut trees out of the woods or sent other people to do it and then created lumber out of it and he had just sat there 
And suddenly a flood came, and it started raining. And about the third day, he was beginning to get worried because the creek that ran down through his farming area where he lived was over its banks, and his front yard was being flooded. And then suddenly, it was coming up on his doorsteps and into his house. And about the tenth day, there was so much water in the area that all of his livestock had already drowned, and he was sitting on the roof of his house. He was saying, Lord, I have faith. Save me. But God had already given him instructions what to do. And he didn't follow a one of them out. What would have happened to Noah? I guarantee you there would be no human race today because all eight of those individuals that went into that ark and every animal that was saved would have died. Because you see, faith without works, if he hadn't have actively built that ark, there would have been no animals. There would have been no eight people to come over on this side of the flood to repopulate the earth, and you and I would have had no opportunity for salvation. Faith without works is dead. Absolute. Now, Genesis chapter 6. Then we'll come back to Hebrews 11. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 and 22. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. And if Noah had only had faith, that would have been an absolute statement. There would have been no animal flesh. There would have been no Noah, his wife, three sons, and three daughters. All life would have ceased. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Now look down to verse 22. God warned him. Thus did Noah, and you look back and see what he, he followed every command the Lord gave him. He built the ark exactly the way God told him. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's works, brethren. So Abraham is the next example I want to give. Noah went by works completely. And if he hadn't, there would be no human race. Now chapter 11, Abraham, it just gives this whole chapter. People who combine their faith with active faith, which is works. But I want to drop over now to verse 23 to 29 to Moses. And I think this is very interesting because Moses made every excuse in the book not to have works. Think about that now. He was out in the wilderness. He fled for his life because he had been discovered that he killed one of the Egyptians who was a slave taskmaster over the Israelites. He buried him in the sand. It was found out. So, and he was next in line for the Pharaoh ship. And he was a general in the army of Egypt. He was a powerful man. And so he fled for his life out of the confines of Egypt. Verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. So the parents had faith. They didn't just say, we believe in God, but they actually performed something. Because they saw he was a proper child, they knew that God had called him for a specific reason, for a purpose, and that he was going to fulfill the will of God. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment that all the children should be killed. And brethren, you and I should be fearless like Moses' parents and not be afraid of the government's dictates when this beast system starts coming. Because remember, we have a promise. The physical surroundings cannot in any way stop God from giving you eternal life. Amen. Humans can kill us, but God can resurrect us, see? That's the key. Now, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Now, he's suffering affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is pleasure. It says so right here. And it is pleasurable, and that's why the world is engaged in it. But Moses set us the example of faith. You see, here he was, he had faith in God, and he chose, he made a choice. And when he made a choice, then he actively worked to make that choice come about. He said, I will not engage in the palace pleasures. I'll not remain in line for the kingship over all of Egypt, which is the greatest nation at that time on the face of the earth. He said, I'll forsake that, verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. The physical did not mean anything to Moses in comparison to eternal life. 
for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Verse 27. But by faith he forsook Egypt. What was Egypt? It was typifying sin in which Israel was held in bondage, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You see, he that endures unto the end is who's going to be saved. Moses endured and he did not fear Pharaoh. And yet Pharaoh could have had him killed many times. He appeared right before Pharaoh, before each plague, and told him what was going to happen. And each time, Pharaoh could have just told his guards to take him. And yet he didn't fear his life because he knew that God was more powerful than Pharaoh. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Now, I've got a question to ask. What would have happened in Old Testament Israel if the Israelites would not have killed that Passover lamb? Okay, let's finish reading this, and then let's go back and see. And the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And Exodus chapter 12. Let's go back and see, because Moses had faith, and he told all of Israel the exact instructions that God had given them. Start in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, this month, now when you look up the word month, it literally means moon. See, the first little moon, the new moon, is when the month appears. So this new moon, or this month, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, the first month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his, next, his neighbor next unto his house take according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall you make account for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. And we understand that that picture is Jesus Christ, our Passover. A male of the first year, and they would keep it, and they could take either from the sheep or the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Right before sunset, probably between 3 and 6 p.m., late in the afternoon of the 14th, they kill this lamb. Notice what they were to do with it, verse 7. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein you shall eat. They were to actively show their faith. Not just say, we have faith in God or in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we would say today, but they literally went out and performed. He that does the will of my Father. He's the one that Jesus won't reject. Now, they literally put blood on the doorpost, on the upper post. They put it all around the door, but they didn't put it on the threshold. Because you see, we don't trample on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So we don't walk on the blood. That's why it wouldn't put on the threshold where they walked on the ground. Now, if they hadn't have performed that, what would have happened to those people in Egypt? Okay, let's drop down to verse 37 for just a minute. Verse, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. If they had not performed this activity, notice what would have happened. Um, verse 11. Or verse 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. If they had not had faith, combined with works to kill that lamb and then put the blood on the doorpost so that they would come under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They would have died. The firstborn in every Israelite family would have died. If, you, if they hadn't have had faith with works, Israel would have been a decimated nation. They would not have had deliverance from Egypt. It's only because faith combined with works they were delivered from bondage. Because you see, when they came under the shed blood, they were rendered innocent. 
And without that rendering of innocent, they would not have come out of bondage. They would have not been, as it were, in the New Testament community, forgiven of all of our sins. Now, let's go down to verse 37 of Exodus chapter 12. And I want to just mention one verse. I'm going to turn back to it. You don't have to, but I'm going to read it word for word out of Hebrews chapter 11. Then we'll stay in Exodus just for a moment. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's the faith chapter. I want to conclude the last verse where it's talking about Moses. Because I think this is very exciting. And when you relate it to the days of unleavened bread, faith and works combined, it really gets exciting. Because then you can be, begin to understand Jesus. And you can understand his statement that people would come and cast out demons in his name. They would extol his name. They would praise his name. And yet he would turn around and reject them and say, I never knew you. Now, the last verse, verse 29 of Hebrews 11. By faith they, that's Israel, passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians trying to do were drowned. Now get the setting here. Israel is now going to be redeemed by God. The shed blood is what's going to protect them from death. Just like the New Testament Christian, when they accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ, are forgiven from their sins. Now, Egypt was a type of sin holding Israel in bondage. Just like sin holds us into bondage to death. Now, let's go to chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 37. And let's look at a little chronology of what happened after they put the blood of that Passover lamb on the doorpost. Verse 37. At midnight, when the death angel went over, no Israelite died. Suddenly Pharaoh rose up in the night and he said, Look, one of each in a family is dead. Children of Israel, get up, get out of here. Leave Egypt. And then in verse 33, the Egyptians were urging upon the people. So they were looking for a fast exit. Egypt knew that if they stayed there, they might be next. You see, none of the Egyptians wanted to be the next one to die. The firstborn was dead. So now in verse 37, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. So suddenly, after the death angel went over, deliverance was in process because they not only had faith, they had works. Faith plus works combined and God rendered them innocent. And now he was going to deliver them completely from bondage. So on the 15th day, the first day of unleavened bread, they began to leave Egypt and they left from Ramesses. Now, this was in 1487 B.C. At the end of the 15th day, they came to Succoth and they camped there. That was a Thursday, if those who have studied out history and chronology understand it correctly. And that's all I'm going to give you. Now, Exodus chapter 13, verse 20, the first part. And they took their journey from Succoth. That was at the end of the 15th day, or starting the 16th. And they journeyed from Succoth and encamped in Etham. So now at the end of the 16th day, which was Friday, they camped at Etham. And they stayed over there on the Sabbath day because they weren't going to journey and perform labor on the Sabbath day. So now you have three days journey out of Egypt. The 15th, the 16th, and the 17th day. Three days of unleavened bread. They're leaving. Now in the last part of verse 20. In the edge of the wilderness. So they came and they encamped in the edge of the wilderness. And then they went into the wilderness. Now notice what happened though in verse 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. So it was a cloud by day to lead them the way. And by night a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of, cloud of fire by night from before the people. So now they're beginning to wander in the wilderness the 18th day. That would be corresponding to our Sunday. Now in chapter 14, verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt, here's Pharaoh now, he had already sent to Moses, look, get your people up, get out of here, lest we all be dead people. And so they did. But now the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, didn't realize, hey, they did what I told them. And so word was brought to him, and by now it's already the 20th or um, Monday, which would be the 19th day of the first month. So this is the fifth day of unleavened bread. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, 
And they said, why have we done this? Look, we were stupid. Why did we let our slaves go? Now, we are going to have to do all the work. We're going to have to build the pyramids. We're going to have to go out and get the uh, straw out of the field and build the bricks. We're going to have to do it ourselves. Why did we let free slave labor go? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So suddenly, he wised up and said, look, let's go overtake them and bring them back. Now, drop down to verse 9. This will be Tuesday, the 20th day of the first month, or the sixth day of unleavened bread. And the Egyptians pursued after them all of the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea. Now this was by Pahirath. Okay, so now they're camping at the end of the 20th day. And starting at sunset will be the seventh day of unleavened bread. Now, remember we'd already seen that God was going to lead them in a pillar, a cloud, by day. And then by fire, a pillar of fire at night. So we can know whether it's day or night by which is appearing. Whether it's a cloud or whether it's the fire in the cloud. So we know. Now, let's go down to chapter 14, starting in verse 13 through 31. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There were seven days of unleavened bread. They were at the end of the sixth day. They were not out of sin yet. They were not out of bondage. They had started fleeing. As it were, they were repenting of all of their sins. That's what it pictures to us, the New Testament church. When we accept the shed blood, the sacrifice of Christ, our Passover, then we start the repenting process. And seven is a number of completion for God. Of course, we go all of our lives in a constant state of repentance. But notice seven is going to be the deliverance. It's going to be total deliverance once we reach the seventh day of unleavened bread. Fear you not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he'll show you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, and remember Egypt was holding them in bondage. It was a type of sin. You shall see them again no more forever. And what does that picture to us? That means when we've come out of bondage, we've accepted the shed blood of Jesus Christ, when we have done something works, which I'm going to show you in a second, then all of our sins are forgiven. And at a future time, when we become spirit, then we will literally have God's seed in us and we will never sin again. And we will never see bondage of sin again for all eternity. Now, verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you. And that's exactly what he's doing for us in the New Testament community today. And you shall hold your peace. You see, he was going to totally break Satan as it is, Egypt, in the New Testament. Satan and his demons hold over the New Testament community. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore cry you unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift you up your rod, and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. What's about to take place? Didn't we see in Hebrews 11 verse 29 that suddenly Moses led Israel through the Red Sea? He led them right through the Red Sea. Okay. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Verse 17. And I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So what, what this is showing us is that Satan and his demons are relentless. They never stop in pursuing Christians to destroy us. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, because you see, God is going to save us, and there is no other name under heaven but Jesus Christ, whereby men can be saved, and all knees are going to bow to him. And so it is, he is going to show that in the Old Testament in type. He's going to destroy completely the armies of the enemies. And upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon the horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face, and stood behind them. So now God is going to make a difference between those who were under the shed blood and between those who were not under that shed blood. Just like God is making a difference in the New Testament community today between those who are coming under the shed blood and they understand faith combined with works is what renders us innocent. 
He's making a difference and he's narrowing us down. He's trying the hearts of the church today on a global basis. That's what he's doing. In verse 20, And it came to pass the camp of the Egyptians, or, or it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, that was Egypt, but it gave light by night to these or to Israel, so that the one came not near the other. Verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Now, let's stop right there, temporarily. Because we need to, well, no, let's don't. I'll save the next, uh, next scripture for on down in the context. Verse 23, And the Egyptians pursued and went in into the midst of the sea after them. And all Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and the horsemen. So this was going to be total and complete deliverance from everything. And if you want to compare it to the New Testament church, every physical thing that could hold us into bondage. Every appetite of the flesh. Because you see, it was a totality of the destruction of this army. Everything. Even the chariots, the horsemen, the horses themselves. Everything physical that would hold Israel into bondage was to be utterly and totally destroyed. And that's exactly what God is going to do with us. Every physical thing that brings us to bondage and causes us to slip in sin must be rooted out through the days of unleavened bread. That's the lesson we're learning. Verse 24. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, you only have morning watches at night, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire. Nighttime. Nighttime, the 15th or the 21st day of unleavened bread. It's now the night portion of the, of the last day of unleavened bread. And they troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels, or you might say loosen them, so that once they go out into the sea, all their wheels will fall out and they can't escape. So that they drove them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And that's exactly what Satan and his demons are going to do when Jesus Christ returns and we have a spirit body, they're going to be confined. And then ultimate destruction. Matthew 25, 41. The lake of fire will be prepared for the devil and his angels. Total, complete victory is yet to be ours over Satan that holds us in bondage of death. Verse 26. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength, when the morning appeared. So as the dawning and the little rays of light and, and daytime began to appear, Moses raised his hands, the waters came back, and here were the Egyptians in the middle of the sea, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one total Complete destruction of the enemy is what God is going to do in the person of Jesus Christ. And you and I will be salvaged, and that is the good news. We will be saved. Verse 29, But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left hand. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. I think this is absolutely important because in verse 30 here, it said that the Lord who became Jesus Christ saved Israel. And what is the significance of all this to us in the New Testament? What is this event to us? And does the New Testament church at large that preaches faith what, do they understand what this really means? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10 begins to explain what this is to the New Testament church. Israel was only a type going through the Red Sea. But what about the New Testament church? What did this do for the, uh, for the Israelites? Verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and we saw it it was a pillar of fire by night, and they went through the Red Sea. 
and all passed through the sea and were all baptized. Do we grasp what the days of unleavened bread really mean? The sacrifice of Jesus. We accept His shed blood in our stead so that we'll never have to die for all eternity. And then suddenly we start repenting, stop violating God's everlasting covenant, come into a, a, a working relationship with it of obedience, and then once we start obeying, it's inevitable. The more we learn of God's Word, what's going to happen? Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. When they came through the sea, they were literally saved from bondage. They were released through baptism. The seventh day of unleavened bread broke the power of Egypt or sin over their lives. The victory was Israel's through Jesus Christ over Egypt. Total deliverance. There wasn't one Egyptian left. Egypt was a devastated, destroyed nation and it has never risen since that time. Now, let's get down to the final few scriptures today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the last part, and verse 8, the first part. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The feast is for seven days. And when we accept that sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, then we repent of breaking that covenant. We change from sin to obedience. Then we learn about Acts 2, verse 38, the exact same scriptures that the apostles stood up on the day of Pentecost and told those people who were convicted in their heart and said, look, what are we going to do about it? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You see, repent and baptism. Israel went through the Red Sea and they were baptized on the seventh day of unleavened bread showing the bondage was broken completely. And so when you and I accept Jesus, we repent, we go down into that watery grave of baptism, sin is broken from our life. We're released from bondage. But I've got to prove it. The last two scriptures, or three, We've got to prove that baptism is of absolute necessity to the New Testament Christian just like Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. So you see, faith with the work of baptism releases us from sin and bondage. Now in Matthew chapter 28, also this is Jesus Christ when he was about to ascend into the heavens. He was about to ascend. He had already been resurrected from the dead. He appeared to his apostles. And as Jesus spoke, or came and spoke unto them, saying, All power, this is all authority, is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Observe is works. You see, faith in the shed blood, but then we observe everything God said. And one of those things was baptizing them. Brethren, baptism is an absolute necessity. Now do you see the problem with those who teach faith only? Because they don't baptize. Some may, but not all. Now, when you read Matthew chapter 7 again, which I started out with earlier, and verse 21, it makes all the sense in the world when we see that we are rendered innocent by works. Faith with works renders us innocent. Matthew 7 verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, I've got faith, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does, it's he that performs the will of God. Brethren, now, for the last couple of scriptures, and the results will be, if you have faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, if you are repenting, turning away from breaking God's covenant to obeying it, then you're going to want to be baptized, which releases you from the bondage of sin. Romans chapter 6. It becomes very clear when we understand the days of unleavened bread that baptism is an absolute necessity. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 5 to start with. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that's breaking God's covenant, that grace may abound? God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin, and we're going to see how you're going to die to sin live any longer therein. Know you not that so many of us as we're baptized, that's past tense, we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into His death. 
Brethren, when you go down to the watery grave of baptism, you're picturing all over again Jesus dying. And you must die just like Jesus died, but symbolically in baptism. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with Jesus by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Let's stop right there. Turn. We're coming back there, so hold your finger there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to read this out of the New International Version. So it'll read a little different, but it has the same meaning. It just does away with the these and thous and, and the yees and this type thing. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 15. Or verse 14. For Christ's love, com love compels us because we are convinced that one died. That's Jesus for all. And therefore all died. How did all die? In baptism. You see? Verse 15. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. We're now to live for Jesus. We have no say so in our life. Not anymore at all. Verse 16, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. See, we don't look at each other as worldly. We look at each other as potential sons and daughters of God that He is perfecting. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and how did you become in Christ? Except in the shed blood, then you repent of violating His covenant. Then you are baptized into His death. If you've done that, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. You're totally released from the bondage of sin. Verse 18, all this is from God. Amen. Brethren, that's strong. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. That is what God is doing through baptism. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Jesus, him, who had no sin to be sin for us. That's why if Jesus became sin for us and he died, we have to go down to the watery grave of baptism in the likeness of his death. It's symbolic, but we must go down in there. Now let's go back to Romans 6, verse 5. For if we, New Testament church, has been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's baptism, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What does that mean? What is a reciprocal agreement? If you do this, I will do this. Jesus says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right here on paper, says, if you go down into the watery grave of baptism and you come up out of that water, then I will, just like God the Father, raise me to a spirit body, I will raise you. But if you don't fulfill the days of unleavened bread, accept the sacrifice, not just stop there in faith, but then continue in works of repentance and baptism then I am not obligated as God the Father and Jesus Christ to resurrect you from the dead. You see, this is strong, an understanding of the days of unleavened bread. Israel was saved. Egypt was destroyed. It was through baptism. You and I, verse 6, look at this. Knowing this, that it's baptism, we're buried with Jesus. Then we come up in a resurrection that our old man is crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Just like Egypt was destroyed, so that when we go down to the watery grave of baptism, we come up, we leave sin in that grave. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Brethren, we cannot serve sin. The last two scriptures, then my summary, the last two verses rather, verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. We just read that when you go down into the watery grave of baptism in a likeness of Jesus' death in the, in the grave, then you are dead and you leave your sins there. So now when you come up, you're free. You have no sins committed or being a, uh, God is holding against you. Verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, 
we believe that we shall also live with him eternal life so brethren the conclusion of everything I've said today is that it is because of Jesus sacrifice that we will go ahead repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus to destroy sin this is a part of the meaning of the days of unleavened bread